Okay. Good evening, everyone. Buenas tardes a todos. Soy Angela Hedrick con el Departamento de Policía de Salem. Soy la gerente de Iniciativas Estratégicas. I'm Angie Hedrick, the Salem Police Department Strategic Initiatives Manager. Can I just say, we are so pleased to see so many faces here tonight. Estamos encantados de ver tantos vecinos aquí para esta importante primera conversación. Repito, primera conversación sobre el tema de violencia armada en nuestra comunidad. So tonight, as part of this important first conversation, and yes, it's our first conversation, we will hear from Salem Mayor Chris Hoy, our Police Chief Trevor Wilmack. Escucharemos esta noche comentarios de parte del alcalde de Salem, Chris Hoy, y nuestro jefe de policía, Trevor Wilmack. And afterward, tonight's facilitator will guide us in a discussion and a question and answer session. Después, el facilitador nos guiará en una discusión y también una oportunidad para preguntas y respuestas. So let's get started. Entonces, comencemos. Les presento el alcalde de Salem, our mayor, Chris Hoy. Well, good evening, everyone. It is so nice to see so many people here. I really appreciate you coming out this evening and joining Chief Womack and I here in East Salem to have this conversation. Tonight, we will be discussing how we can join together as a community to address the violence we are seeing in our city. Chief Womack and I have been having uh, this discussion for some time now regarding the violence that's occurring and the violent crimes that we're seeing. It's been going, we've been having these conversations for a little over a year. Tonight's discussion is a continuation of those conversations and the next step after our joint work session that we held in November. As you may remember, Last November, we received a presentation on the findings of the gun violence problem analysis. At that time, we were presented with excellent information on the problem, how it's growing, who is being impacted, and where those impacts occur. We've also heard that we, as a community, can make a positive impact on the problem. And we can start to make an impact because we have good information to start with. We know who is involved. We know more youth are getting involved. We know that the number of people engaged in violence is limited to a small segment of members of our community. It's about 0.01% of the community. We know that the people involved generally know one another. And we know that those impacted are also young, have a history of participating in or being impacted by violence, and have limited access to pro-social support systems. The scale and scope of this problem and the knowledge we have about who is impacted and involved provide us with an important opportunity to interrupt this behavior. We have an amazing leader in Chief Womack who is an expert in violence prevention and we have a skilled and committed police force. And we know that enforcement is only part of the solution needed to reduce community violence. What we are creating here tonight is a committed community partnership that includes community-based organizations, youth and community leaders, members of law enforcement, and criminal justice. And we have another important group of supporters here as well. How many of you came out tonight just because you're a member of the community and you care about Salem? Let me see your hands. That is excellent. Thank you so much for, for being here and for showing up for this conversation. We need everyone here to come together to create systems that support our community members and interrupt violence. I know that many of you are here because you already are committed to this work. You want to support our community, provide pro-social opportunities, provide pathways out of negative behaviors, and offer alternatives that are safe and viable. Tonight is the first of our CVRI meetings where, we'll all, where we will continue to increase awareness of this issue, build our list of stakeholders and partners, and gather input to inform our efforts. As the mayor of Salem and a member of this community, thank you for being here tonight, and thank you for your commitment to our city. I look forward to seeing what we will create together. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Trevor Womack. I'm the Chief of Police here in Salem, and I'll echo a few of the mayor's comments. I first want to start out by just thanking everyone for being here. The fact that you're here shows that you do care and that you want to engage with us on this conversation 
on this incredibly important public safety issue that we're facing. Specifically here tonight, we'll be very blunt and upfront what we're talking about. We're talking about shootings occurring in our, in our city, um, especially shootings occurring uh, out northeast Salem, where we are tonight. So I'm very happy that you're here. This is a first step, as the mayor indicated. We'll have additional meetings, but this is a good first step to get the conversation started. The rise in shootings and violent crime in Salem is affecting everybody at some level, for sure, and violence resulting in the loss of life or serious physical or emotional injury in our community. It leaves friends and families reeling. Um, it forever changes the trajectory of lives for some folks in a profound way. And But we also know that not everyone in Salem is experiencing this violence in the same way. Violence can and do, shootings can and do happen across the city, but they're definitely concentrated in a certain area in our city. And so for folks living in those areas and neighborhoods, they're experiencing the violence in a very up close and personal way. Um, and like I said before, sometimes the impacts are profound and changing lives forever. So that's why we're here. And I want to talk a little bit about that community perspective before we start the conversation, because for me, for my department, for all of us, I think, it's important to keep the perspective of those most affected by the violence in mind as we begin to talk about solutions. So just for a moment, I want to put you, ask you to think about one of our most recent homicides that, we, that occurred in our city, a shooting homicide. A 15-year-old boy was shot and killed, and he was found dead in a pickup truck not too far from here in northeast Salem. Evergreen and D area, parked in front of a single family residence in a neighborhood. And so just imagine for a moment, take a moment to think about that young man's family, uh, their tragic loss, uh, how they're feeling today still, I'm sure. Think about the family that lives in that home where that tragedy occurred in front of their house and how that changes their perspective on their th feeling of safety in their own neighborhood where they live. Think about the person that found that young man dead in the vehicle and how that changes that person's view on safety and well-being. No one should have to experience that in our community. That's not tolerable. And I think it's important that we keep the perspective of those individuals especially, the ones that are directly impacted by the violence occurring in our community, at the top of our mind while we begin this discussion. Another perspective that I think is important to bring to the front of mind right now that's on my mind often and weighs heavy on me is the perspective of our police officers as well. So our police officers are daily seeing what's happening with violence in our community. They're exposed to it daily. And the fact of the matter is, as shootings increase in the community, so too does the risk of an officer being involved in a shooting or, God forbid, being shot and killed in our community. So the safety and well-being of our police officers matters also, of course, and their experiences and their thoughts on how to approach this problem matters as well. So I think we want to start this conversation keeping that at the front of our minds, the community members that are most affected, and our police officers that are experiencing this as well. And by the way, they're not too different. They're not two separate groups. The police are the community, the community are the police. There's many of my staff who either grew up here in Salem or they live here now and they're raising their families here. I live in Salem. And so the level of violence in our community affects all of us, community and police officers alike. So that's why we're here. Our North Star here is to reduce shootings. That's the problem that we all need to focus on and concentrate our collective efforts on. So we're introducing a community violence reduction initiative, as the mayor announced, um, for that very purpose, to focus our collective efforts on that goal, reducing shootings. We're using that term, community violence, Intentionally, it's a term that comes from the federal government. There's some grant opportunities, for example, to reduce community violence. And so I want to define that term. We're talking about a specific type of violence. Um, you could think of it as street violence. It's violence, serious assaults that occurs out in our community, in public places, places like shopping centers or schools or parks, out on the streets of Salem, not inside homes necessarily. It also involves people that aren't necessarily related or even know each other very well at all. So it's not domestic violence, for example. That's a different type of violence. We're talking about that community violence, the street violence that happens out in public spaces between people who may or may not know each other very well at all. So we want to stay focused on that definition as well. So in collaboration with our criminal justice system partners, our policing partners, I see some in the room here today. Thanks. I see Sheriff Nick Hunter there. I know 
Um, district attorney is here too, I think. I'm sorry, it's hard to see. Uh, Brendan Murphy's here. I see you. Thank you, Brendan. Um, and others as well. So the collaboration is strong with our criminal justice partners, and we're already taking steps to intervene. We're taking a, an initial or an intentional process here of engaging our community about developing strategies, but I want to reassure everyone that the criminal justice system is already active and engaged and try to intervene, intervene and interrupt this cycle of violence that we're experiencing. And I'll talk a little bit more about that tonight. As we begin the discussion on the right solutions, the right strategies for Salem, for our community, it's important to look at the data. That's why we see data up on the boards here. If you're going to solve any complex problem, the starting point, the first step is always to understand the problem as best you can. So I want to review some of the data so we all come in with a shared awareness of the exact problem that we're trying to solve, and we can stay focused on that data. What we know from the data, and there's a lot of information also available on our website, on our transparency portal. If you just search Salem Police Department Transparency Portal, all this information's there. Our gun violence problem analysis report. There's also a 15-year crime summary that takes a longer term look at crime trends in Salem. It's very important that we look at those long-term trends. It's almost meaningless. It's not very useful to look at, for example, how many homicides did we have this year versus last year. That changes a lot year to year. If you step back and look at a 10 or 15 year period, you get a much better indication of what's happening with violence in our community. So just quickly on that topic, I'll say that violent crime in Salem has been on the rise for 10 years, since 2014. And that's also what's shown That's the rate, so it includes population growth. It incorporates for that. So the rate of violence in our community has been rising for 10 years. It's not a new problem. When you talk about violent crime in general, you're there you're talking about murder, rape, armed robberies, serious physical assaults like stabbings and shootings. That's what we're talking about. So it's been on the rise in Salem for 10 years. More recently, though, when we talk about the shootings that are increasing, this community violence that we're talking about, um, shootings have doubled. We did an analysis for five years' worth of data. And shootings doubled, as you can see, from 2018 to 2022. Those are the fatal and non-fatal injury shootings. So shooting homicides and non-fatal injury shootings doubled in that five-year period. So we wanted to understand that more. We had some researchers come in, really look at each and every one of those cases that occurred over that five-year period. We want to know where they're happening, why they're happening, who's most at risk of being involved. And that's a lot of this data that we have here. This is a printout or an enlargement of a summary that we have on our website as well. And hopefully some of you probably grabbed a copy of that on the way in also. So let's just review some of that. We know from the data that shootings happen in a relatively small area of Salem. It's roughly five square miles. Now, shootings do happen everywhere throughout our community, but they're definitely concentrated in that five square mile area. That's only about 11% of our geography as a city. So what's important about that, what jumps out at that for me, is that what seems often to be a large, out-of-control, unmanageable problem, it starts to look a little more manageable when you think about how concentrated this is in this area. It's important to stay focused on where the data points us and directs us. It also reinforces what I said before about your perspective on violence in this community it is heavily dependent upon where you live, work, and play. So who's involved? Who are at most at risk? It's also very important to understand. So we know from the data that most of our shootings, the victims and the suspects involved in shootings, are young adults, adults over the age of 18, generally 18 to 34, so young adults in the vast majority of our shootings. And they're overwhelmingly male, which is not a surprise. 87% of our shootings involve men. About half of our shooting victims and perpetrators are Latino. And I say that because that's what the data shows us. It's not about labeling any group disparaging any group. This is about risk identification for the equitable redirection or creation of services to reduce risk. When I say that, reduce risk, what that really means is save people's lives. That's what this is about. We also know that juvenile involvement is on the increase. In that five-year study period, juvenile violence was increasing within that study period too, so it's ramping up. And we found that about 18% of the shooters involved in these shootings were under the age of 18, and about 10% of the victims. So it actually weighed heavier year towards the offenders, those committing the violence, as young individuals under the age of 18. But it's important to keep in mind that that's still less than 20% of our total shootings. That means about 80% involve those young men that I talked about before, 18 to 34. 
So as we approach this problem, what the data, data tells us is that we have to be concerned about the juvenile involvement. We have to think about strategies to interrupt that cycle and prevent and intervene for juveniles. But we also, vast majority of the cases involve young adults, make sure we stay intentionally focused on intervention and prevention efforts for young men in our community as well. Also, we know from the analysis that about half of our shootings involved men that are associated with gangs or groups, groups of individuals that know each other that are involved in criminal activity. That's what we're referring to here, too. Obviously, if you're involved in a group that's involved in criminal activity, naturally your risk for things happening to you increases. That's what the data shows us. It's a risk indicator. So this is not about labeling young men in our community as gang members. I'm very sensitive to that, what that means and all that entails. Again, this is about identifying risk so then we can come together as a community and understand what's the right way to reduce that risk, save lives. As the mayor mentioned, it's a relatively small number of people that are connected to gangs or groups in that way. We estimate it's about 200 people or less. It's less than 0.01% of our population. So just like the concentration that we have in our area of 11% of our city, when you're talking about it, several hundred people, less than 0.01% of our community, you can focus. It can make a big difference. And what seems like an out-of-control, unmanageable problem begins to look manageable. There's things that we can do here to have a dramatic impact if we pay attention to the data. We also took a look at how our unsheltered population is affected or involved in violence in our community. We all know that our unsheltered population has been on the increase up and down the West Coast for several years. What we found was about 15% of our shootings, again, these shootings in this five-year period here, involved a victim or a suspect that was unsheltered. And when I say homeless in this situation, I mean living out on the streets in an unmanaged environment, people out on the streets of Salem that are homeless. That group, the subgroup, actually trended more towards the victimization. So the risk was higher to be a victim when you're unsheltered than be an offender. But it was about 15% of the shootings involved an unsheltered individual. So again, it helps us focus on where we need to pay attention and direct our resources. So these data are extremely important. Again, what seems to be an unmanageable overwhelming problem can begin to seem manageable, gives us hope, and we don't have unlimited resources or money. So we have to focus. It's critical that we focus, pay attention to this data. We also know we're not the first community that's ever dealt with this problem. There are models out there to Look, look for and learn from. Every city needs to develop their own strategy that's specific to their community, but there are models to follow and to learn from what's effective in other areas. And what we do know, generally speaking, the most effective strategies involve the police. And when I say the police, I'm speaking on behalf of the entire criminal justice system here with me, the police and the community together, together. And so we need to take steps as a criminal justice system, but we also need to develop community capacity to prevent and intervene and have these community-based efforts as well and try to align those together. That's when you're going to get the exponentially bigger results. That's what the research tells us and the evidence tells us is most effective. And that's what we're after. There's no time to waste. These are life-or-death situations for our community members. And so I want to touch a little bit about what criminal justice system policing uh, collaboration looks like, some of the things that we're doing. I'll just touch on that lightly before we move forward. And I want to mention and introduce someone that's here with me today. Debbie, if you just stand up just for a second. This is Deputy Chief Deborah Aguilar. She's actually officially a Deputy Chief on Friday. So I'll be, thank you, Debbie. I'll be swearing her in Friday. And so I'm introducing her because uh, she's leading this effort for me on behalf of my department. So she and I together are focused on these collaborative efforts. Together, we are making shootings reduction a priority for our department. It is the top priority for our department. For me and my staff, there's no important higher level priority than uh, the safety, the physical safety of our residents, the people that we serve and protect. And our partners are aligned with this as well. I want to thank Marion County Sheriff Hunter for being here. I mentioned you are also already sheriff. We talk often about all sorts of topics. We talked just this morning about community violence and how we're approaching this problem. We, we are collaborating closely and well, and especially um, in certain areas of our community, on the east side especially, there's this jigsaw puzzle of a dividing line of where city 
starts and ends and the county starts and ends. And when shootings happen on one side or the other, it doesn't matter for our community. It shouldn't matter what jurisdiction that occurs in. We should be working closely together to make sure we're sharing information and collaborating, and that's just what we're doing. So I know because I speak to the sheriff frequently that he, too, is making this a priority for his organization as well. So, Sheriff, I want to thank you for that leadership from the top of calling this out as a priority for your agency as well. We're also seeing leadership from our elected leaders, the mayors here tonight. He mentioned a joint work session. I wanted to call out that example. I don't know when the last time that happened in Salem. But when that gun violence problem analysis report was produced, the first thing we did is we came together as elected leaders, Marion County commissioners, city councilors, and our mayor. We had a joint work session in the same room to look at that data together because we know we're going to have to approach this problem together. So we're seeing leadership from the top with our elected officials as well. It's very encouraging. I'm, I, I'm hopeful that we'll have another work session. I know that the sheriff's office and the county are now doing another gun violence problem analysis. This initial data we had was only city of Salem data. And so now the county is also doing the same type of research, look at shootings that are happening in the county. We have that report. We'll be able to come together again and even learn more, and it'll help us align our resources even better. And what, what do we do? This is especially our lane. We're law enforcement professionals. We enforce the law. We respond to crime. We investigate crime, and we solve crimes, and we arrest offenders. If you pick up a gun in this community and you use it against somebody illegally, we will identify you. We will find you. We will arrest you in constitutionally appropriate ways, and you'll be prosecuted fairly through the system and held accountable. That's what we're committed to, and that's what we do. We do a very, very good job of that. We have almost a 100% homicide rate, a clearance rate for our homicides in this community. We solve our cases. We want to make sure that we continue to fund ourselves appropriately, train ourselves, and equip ourselves properly to do that work. And a lot of partners are helping us with that now. So we have a Marion County Safe Streets Task Force, or a Violent Crimes Task Force that exists. There's some formalized agreements in place. And I want to mention the folks that are involved in that. These, this is a team that's actively calling out violence, working to solve shootings, seize illegal firearms in our community, and prosecute the most violent offenders. These partners include us, the Salem Police Department, the FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigations, the Marion County Sheriff's Office, our Marion County District Attorney, Kaiser Police Department, the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, ATF, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. They're definitely focused on illegal guns being used in our community and prosecuting traffickers of illegal guns. The U.S. Attorney's Office is helping us pick up some of the cases for the most violent offenders and prosecute them federally. We have Woodburn Police Department involved. There's a lot of connections sometimes between cases there and, and Salem also. And also the U.S. Marshal Service, who are very, very good at locating and apprehending folks that are wanted for violent crimes. So that partnership exists. We're meeting regularly. We're calling out violence, and we're prioritizing that as a group. It creates many more shared resources to bring to bear on this problem. We're also enhancing our technology. I just want to give a few examples. Automated, automated license plate readers. They're just cameras that capture license plates only in our community in different areas. And what that does, it plugs into a system to where we can quickly identify if a vehicle is used in a crime. We can know where that vehicle was, or if we know the vehicle is wanted in a crime, we can quickly identify where they are when it pops up on our radar and intervene. That, ex that program is expansion is expanding with the addition of our body more camera system. We have in-car cameras now. Every one of our police cars now captures license plates with an automated license plate reader. The amount of data is incredible, and it's very helpful for solving violent crime cases. We are also at the Salem Police Department become, becoming a major hub here in Oregon for ballistic evidence processing. So our partnership with the ATF has allowed us to get the technology needed to analyze shell casings and bullets that are left at crime scenes and the, and the capacity to analyze that data, which helps us connect cases. So, for example, we will find guns that have been used in Salem and in Portland and in Seattle and in Woodburn. And that helps us connect cases and identify who's responsible and intervene. So we're leveraging and expanding our technology as well. And just generally, our information and data sharing is on the rise. With that example of the Marion County data analysis occurring is just one good example. One other step that we just took as a community, so our mayor and our council just temporarily authorized some funding for two, just two years for a new 
uh, violence coordinator position to operate out of the city manager's office. We haven't filled this position yet, but it's a step forward. The idea there is that position would help coordinate some of the community capacity that we're talking about developing. Things like this meeting right now, a person would help us convene those type of discussions and coordinate resources. So that's a good step forward for us. It's temporary funding, though. We're facing a budget crisis right now. We need to find permanent, lasting funding for resources like that, including resources that are needed at the police department, by the way. So today's meeting is a key first step in developing the community-based response that we need. I'm excited to now also introduce someone who's here with me, Mr. Ben McBride, to help facilitate this part of the community conversation. I'll turn it over to him, but he'll introduce himself too. But Ben has a unique set of skills and experiences about bridge building, bringing communities together, but he also draws upon a very deep personal experience on community violence reduction. I think is very valuable. So, Ben, I'd like to turn it over to you now. So, thank you. Good evening. Good evening. You know, you're going to have to talk back to me tonight. Let's try it one more time. Good evening. So, first, I want to just start off um, and say that looking in this room this evening, reminds me of a room I sat in about 13 years ago. But the things that you all are already ready to do as a city, we had to organize around, bring our mayor to sit on the platform, bring our police chief and the chief of probation to be on the platform and demand that they would do. And I want to just encourage you that you all are starting way ahead of where we were 13, 14 years ago. And I know that that has happened from a lot of unnamed people and work and conversations that have happened. So before I start, can we just take a moment and applaud each other and all the work that's gone into making tonight possible? So I am Ben McBride. Um, I live in the Bay Area in California. And so I think a fair question tonight is, why am I here uh, in Salem, Oregon? And uh, what relevance might I bring to this conversation in this moment that you all are in uh, thinking about what it really will take to reduce uh, gun related homicides here in Salem? And how do you do it in a way uh, that really centers the people who are closest to the pain? Um, while I know that gun violence is impacting everybody across the region, I want to just ask quickly for a moment by a show of hands, uh, how many folks either live in Northeast Salem or would say that Northeast Salem is home or your roots. Can I just get a quick hand raise? Thank you. What I want to say to us is that you know this issue more than anyone because you've lived it and you're experiencing it. I also experienced this in the place that I grew up and came from and lived for 15 years. Um, about 15 years ago, um, at the time, I was uh, engaged in being a faith leader, community leader. I was leading nonprofit organizations in Oakland, California. And that was the year, 2006, actually, that we had 148 homicides in a city of 400,000 people. We also had over 500 shootings, which meant that per capita, our city had more shootings and homicides than Chicago. It meant that there was a black or brown body that was dying. Majority men, a lot of the data that you all heard here was die every other day in the city. And the only reason our homicides hadn't broke 200, 300 was because we also have the best gunshot hospital in the country. It was during that time that I relocated with my wife and three daughters into an area that they were calling the kill zone, which is in East Oakland, very similar to East Salem. And it's the area where the majority of the gun related homicides happen. And at that moment, 15 years ago, there were a lot of conversations, a lot of great ideas about what we should do. Fantastic ideas, very talented people, smart people who had a lot of different ideas about what we needed to do. But I want to just share a little bit of our personal story about what we actually did do. But here's the hope story I want you to have already at the end. Our city, a city that had averaged 100 homicides every year for 40 years, reduced gun-related homicides by 50% over five years. 
So I'm, I'm here a little bit from Salem's future, if you will, to tell us that we can solve the epidemic of gun violence in our communities. We can save lives and we can do so even in the areas and the communities where it feels the most difficult to do. It was for the reason that the organization that um, myself and my wife started a decade ago, Empower Initiative, we started this organization because one of the things that we realized in the middle of trying to implement a gun violence prevention strategy was that what was difficult was finding ways to get people who had very different perspectives to sit down at the table and stay at the table and agree upon a shared strategy to implement so that we could do the work to save lives. So here's one of the things that we ran into, and this might sound a little bit familiar to you all story. At the time of our beginning, many people were saying, well, we need to focus on the young people. Very important for us to focus on the young people. They were saying we need to focus on our teenagers. We need to focus on our kids. Some people said we need more after school programs. Some people said we need more community center resources. All of these things were true. But one of the things that we learned then, and it is still true now, and this happens across the country, that is less than a half percent of any city's population that leads to over 60 percent of the gun related homicides. That data point is, is true in Salem and it's true across the country. Here's what it meant for us in Oakland. I want to boil it down out of those percentages and really make it a real story for us. We have 400,000 people in our city, and what we found out from doing the data was that everybody wasn't shooting at everybody, and everybody wasn't actually shooting. What we found was that our percentage is that it was about 1,000 individuals who belonged to 50 groups who were responsible for the majority of the gun-related homicides. And out of those 1,000 people, there were only about 250 shooters that were actually doing the shooting. And so without that data, what we thought was, we have this overwhelming gun violence epidemic in the city of 400,000, and there's no way for us to be able to come up with an answer. And then we boiled it down and realized we actually had 250 people that we needed to design strategies for. And once we realized that we only needed to reach 250 people to interrupt their violence and then intervene with the other 750 people that would engage in violence after they were removed, then we realized we had a strategy that we could implement. And in the first year that we launched it, we had a 30% reduction in the first year and 39 fewer people died in our city than have been dying on average every year. So what am I saying to us here in Salem? There is a recipe for us to think about how we save lives in our city. And it's not just about the gun-related homicides, but I wanna invite you to think about another statistic. Because sometimes when we think about gun-related homicides, we say, well, why focus on that expression? Why not focus on domestic violence? Why not focus on auto thefts? Why not focus on uh, crimes related to substance abuse? Well, the Center for Disease Control said in 2005, and you can look this up, that the cumulative cost of a gun-related homicide on any city is $1 million. It's the cumulative costs. The RAND report said in 2013 that the cumulative costs, when you talk about community impact, so not just city infrastructure, but the larger impact on community is closer to $3 million. Let's take the conservative number. We know that when someone dies by a gun in our city, it is an impact of a million dollars on our shared resources. What we found by creating a custom violence reduction strategy, what we call a CVI strategy or CVRI strategy, was that if we offered the people who we identify were at the highest risk to commit an act of violence or be a victim of violence, $60,000 job and gave them $20,000 of wraparound services, they were more likely than not to not pick up a gun and shoot another community member. So here's what we did in our strategy. We took the number $80,000, multiplied it times the amount of people who were actually most likely to commit an act of violence, and $80,000 times the number of people who would shoot became our cost for peace. A million dollars 
times the amount of people who we had lost to gun violence was the cost for death. So the question is, we know what peace costs if we are willing to do the work to come together and create this strategy. I wanna say this also, I believe Salem has who it needs. Look at the person next to you. Look at the person next to you, look to the side. We have who we need. The question is, can we co-create what is necessary to save the lives of Salem residents and people across community? Here's the other learning I have, and then I'm gonna take us into some dialogue where I wanna invite us to really be thinking about what is the role that we can play in this strategy. When I first came to the work, I did not want to sit at the table with law enforcement. I'm just going to be honest with you. I didn't want to sit at the table with law enforcement. Now that comes for me out of a personal story, right? Um, the only gun I stared down is out of a police officer when I was 18 years old. Um, my brother was assaulted by a police officer while being a Bible college student and studying to be a pastor. My great uncle was killed by off-duty police officers in North Carolina and lynched for being in an interracial relationship. So I had a lot of personal reasons why I didn't feel comfortable sitting at the table with law enforcement. But what I realized over the course of time was that the only way that we were going to create safe communities was if the expertise that I brought and many others brought, loved ones who were actually experiencing the gun violence and the threat of gun violence, and the law enforcement leaders who also brought the expertise for understanding how public safety would happen, that together, not only could we craft the best strategies, but we could also generate the resources necessary to fund it. And together, we could sit at the table and save lives. And now the work that we did years ago has now become the national model that they're using across the country. So I want to invite us to ask ourselves in this moment, who is it that I need to become in order to make sure that together we save the lives of Salem residents? Now, if you would indulge me, repeat after me, I'm going to turn you to a black church just for one moment. Then you'll go back to being who you are. But repeat after me real quick. Say, everybody doesn't have to do the same thing. But say, everybody has to do something. So the question I want us to be asking is, what is the something that I can do to help ensure that Salem, sisters, brothers, and relatives are no longer dying at the hand of a gun, but we are creating the kind of circle of belonging that ensures that Salem residents become safe. I'll share one more quick hope story because it's not just my stories of sitting at the table with law enforcement, but one of my close colleagues, his name is Jose Asuna. He's from Los Angeles, California. He's done a lot of work with uh, another colleague of mine named Father Greg Boyle, who has an amazing organization in Los Angeles called Homeboy Industries. Well, my, my buddy, Jose Asuna, when he was locked up, he kept hearing about Father Greg, who was doing the gun violence intervention work and building relationships in L.A. So my, my partner, Jose, put a contract out on Father Greg because he was like, I'm going to get Father Greg killed from prison. So when Jose came home, he was like, you know, this guy is messing up my neighborhood. I have a certain way that I want to go about doing things. But then Jose began to sit at the table. And what we realized was that Jose was one of the brothers who brought the most wisdom that was necessary to bring peace to the streets of Boyle Heights in Los Angeles. And then subsequently, not only did Jose sit at the table with Father Greg, but Jose also began to sit at the table with law enforcement. And because of that, they turned around a neighborhood that was plagued with gun violence into a thriving area that now is studied across the world to create peace. What am I saying? We don't all have to love each other and be best friends to save lives. If we're willing to hold space, say that with me, hold space. Hold space. If we're willing to hold space, we can do it. Last piece before we get ready for a discussion. I'm just going to ask everybody really quickly, raise your hand as high as you can. If you're physically able, raise your hand as high as you can. Now raise it a little higher. You saw that? Thank you. When I asked us to raise our hands as high as we could, you went to that limit. But when I asked for a little extra, you found a little extra. 
That's all it takes for us to save lives and save. Nobody's asking us to stop being who you are. The question is, can you find a little extra to bridge, to work alongside others who are different, to find your role in the story, to create peace in Salem? Find that little extra, the extra meeting you're willing to have, the extra story you're willing to hear, the extra relationship you're willing to hold, even when it becomes difficult, recognizing that if we do this work, we will save lives. So over the next several months, we're going to be engaging in some conversations. And my role in being here over the next several months is simply going to be to help bring some of the experience that I've had, not just in doing it in Oakland, but in working in over 10 cities across the country, is to bring some of that experience to just help be some fuel in your rockets to help support you all getting your strategy up into the ground. There's already talks about having a position as someone that will really be able to lead the work. But over the summer, we're going to be having uh, several conversations for the purpose of ensuring that Salem residents and neighbors are co-creating the strategy that will exist. So we're going to meet three times in Northeast Salem in spaces co-created by you to do a few things, explore CBI models, to raise, create space for community to raise specific hopes and concerns about the strategies and to explore how we operationalize these so that by 2025, you all have a strategy that is going to cause peace to be on your streets in a way that none of us have seen before. At the end of that set of events, we're going to produce an evaluation report and recommendations that the chief and leaders have already said that those recommendations will help to form alongside the criminal justice experts, a co-created strategy that you all will be able to successfully implement. But we wanna think about some principles, uh, some guiding principles that can help us think about how we do the work of partnership. So I'm gonna start us off with about four or five uh, principles that have helped guide strategies that have worked across the country. And then I'm going to give you a few minutes to think about what you would like to add to these list of guiding principles as we think about going on this journey to create a gun violence reduction strategy here in Salem. The first one that I would love to put up for us is that the North Star must be focused on fewer shootings. You heard me say that in many cities, people wanna focus on a lot of different expressions of crime. We wanna hold for us, keep a North Star that the goal is to reduce the shootings that are happening in the city. Another guiding principle, follow the data. We can't follow what Pookie, Ray, Ray, Chewy, Jane, and Elisa think. That was a joke. <laughs> but we've got to follow the data. The data will actually tell us who's at a high risk to be shot, who's at a high risk to do the shooting. Another example, from us doing the data and doing the work together, we came up with an actual uh, a rubric, if you will, and what we realized was that those in our city who are between 18 and 35 who were either on probation or parole, had already a previous background for a firearm offense, had known somebody who had been shot within the last six months, and there was another factor, we were able to predict who was at a highest risk to commit an act of violence or be a victim of violence. And it informed the kinds of strategies where we got a chance to go have a conversation with people and say, you're at an incredibly high risk to be shot, and we want to figure out how to come up with a very custom strategy to make sure that we save your life, the lives of your children, and make sure that you live a wonderful and fruitful life. This is the reason that we've got to follow the data. Another guiding principle is measure progress. So we don't want to just think it's going well. We want to actually measure that it's going well. Two more that I want to lift up as a guiding principle we must do intervention and prevention. Somebody say at the same time. 
We've got to do them at the same time. Sometimes people say, let's just work on prevention. We got to help the kids. We got to have after school programs. Absolutely. But if we don't stop the people who are actively shooting, no matter what prevention work we're trying to do for kids, if a kid is growing up in a neighborhood where they're being traumatized by gun violence, it's going to be very difficult for the impact of that program to overdo the experience of that trauma. And lastly, the principle is collaboration between community and the police. These are five principles that I want to kick us off with. North Star, focus on fewer shootings, follow the data, measure progress, intervention and prevention, and collaboration between community and police. I'm going to give you about three minutes really quick to do one of two things or both. Think about what needs to be added to this list, or I want to invite you to turn to your neighbor and have a conversation about what you like or how you think we can improve it. Let's take three minutes, and then I'm going to bring us back. And for those who have thoughts about what other guiding principles we need to have, I'm going to ask you to come to the mic and share those over the mic so that we can get those over the board, okay? Let's take the next three to four minutes. Think about what you want to add to this board or have a conversation with your neighbor about your thoughts about these guiding principles. Let's do that now. All right. Welcome back. Do we have anybody that wants to come to the mic real quick and add to these guiding principles? We're actively right now working. If you could maybe come down to this microphone right here just so we can assure um, everybody can hear you and we'll just I'm going to scribe and get some of these on the board. These are guiding principles that we want to suggest are a part of the way in which we implement uh, this community violence uh, intervention strategy. Si alguien habla español y gusta que yo le traduzca su este, pregunta o su sugerencia, por favor también siéntase con confianza de venir aquí arriba. Thank you. Gracias. Please. Good evening, and thank you for all of your work in the past and in the future. I'm, I pay attention because I'm a veteran of the so-called crack wars in Oakland in the 80s. So, and we fundamentally wanted to save lives. That's what we were about. Uh, I am also the chair of Peace Plaza here in Salem. We're a 35-year-old nonprofit. Our mission is to make peace visible and possible in Salem and beyond. We are currently exploring the possibility of creating what we call a Peace Peers program in the middle and high schools. And peer support is a uniquely influential and uniquely effective way to turn lives around and to support young people. So just so we can create space for others, and I'm right. hoping that we'll have more opportunities to talk, what's that guiding principle that you'd like to add that you think needs to help guide the strategy? That the basis of one-to-one -one interface and interaction is a peer support-based model. Thank you. Come on, let's clap our hands. I appreciate our contribution. I'm just someone else. I'll make it quick. Uh, I believe under the uh, collaboration aspect, it would be nice if there was just constant or co uh, communication. Constant so, not, communication. yeah, not only for those who are in the room, it's awesome that we're here, but we know there's people who aren't here. How can we ensure that they are in the know and in the aware of what we're trying to do here, too, and be a part of the work? All right. Thank you. Come on. Let's appreciate our community member. Please. So when I start thinking of the things that we should be doing to uh, help address these issues, uh, all of them have in common are the things that these people have already said with communication. We've got to concentrate on, on building community and relationships in that community. But one of the things I see missing up there is accountability. We all have to be able to look in the mirror and say, you did this. Because these kids, and they're all kids, 25 is not grown up. These kids don't fail. Parents fail. Teachers fail, not kids. 
So say so, say for me just uh, succinctly so I can capture it. The guiding principle about accountability is, can you say that succinctly? It's to take responsibility for take the responsibility. things happening in our All stakeholders take responsibility. Okay, let's appreciate community our community responsibility. Members. Let's see if we can get two more, and that's going to take us from the five we started to hopefully be in 10, please. Uh, just to learn and grow from conflict. To learn and grow from the conflict. All right, let's appreciate. <laughs> and last but not least. Oh, thank you. I just want to say, like, overcoming the spiral of silence in some of these communities. Mm-hmm. You said there are about 250 people, so there must be somebody immediately around them. They're scared to speak or whatever reason they don't. Mm-hmm. That way we can narrow it down and say how to assist so figuring out how to break the code of silence and, and how to, don't let me put words in your mouth, how do we make sure that we also center and involve people that are part of the community that's being impacted so that they can help Connect. inform how we do the Connect. strategy correctly? The communities can overcome their fear so that they can speak and be part of, they develop agency to put a stop before somebody else needs to put a stop on this. All right, let's appreciate our community members. This is just the beginning, and I want to give, I'm hoping to give us some hope and some inspiring. The strategy that's going to be made is going to take all of us co-creating how it functions, right? What needs to be in it. And I will, just to underscore what you were lifting up, and, and I really appreciate Chief Womack. So this is not a shot at police, but this is something I've learned in the strategy. Law enforcement cannot stop the shooting. They respond after the shooting happens. The only people who can stop the shooting are the people who are shooting. And so what we have found is when we can also find ways to engage and intervene before they shoot. And from every department that I've worked around or city strategy that I've worked around, Law enforcement has always been on the side of is if you can prevent the shooting, we'd much rather you prevent the shooting than us respond to the shooting and investigate the shooting. So I really want to invite us to think about something that uh, my colleague in New York, Glenn Martin, says. I repeat this after me because I want this to be a slogan that we hold to Salem. Say the people closest to the problem problem. are the closest to the solution. So if we want to stop the shooting. The only way that we're going to do it is actually to involve people who've been proximate to the communities and shooters. All right. Again, everybody doesn't have to do the same thing, but everybody has to do something. At the height of our work, one of my metrics was that I had to keep in my phone 10 phone numbers of people who were at the high risk to commit an act of violence or be a victim of violence. I got very comfortable talking to shooters. I got very comfortable driving around in my car with shooters. My wife did not, was not comfortable with me doing that, but I got comfortable doing that because I realized that if we were going to solve gun violence, I couldn't be talking about people. I actually had to be in relationship with people. All of us don't have to do that, but I believe some of us can. And if we figure out who the some of us are that can, that can work with the individuals that are a part of that very small group, likely within that five square mile radius, we can get to the place of peace here in Salem. So we're at that time now. We've talked a lot um, about the strategies. We've heard a lot about the data. We've heard the framing about the resources that are there. We now want to just open it up for questions. Um, And these questions can be for, it could be for the mayor, could be for the chief, um, could be questions, if you have questions, you know, of of myself around just what I have understood and learned from these community violence Uh, intervention strategies, how they've worked, how they've not. But we want to just create some space for people to ask uh, questions. Now, let me say this as we go into this uh, part. A question usually has a question mark at the end of it, right? (laughs) Y'all know, we've all been in these meetings, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. You're in a meeting and somebody gets up and you're like, I'm not so sure that's a question, you know? (laughs) That feels a little bit more like a speech, right? So... I want to invite us to find the question and it's okay if you don't have a question yet. Right. But rather than, you know, um, us, you know, offering uh, statements, 
we want to create some space for questions. One more thing is particularly if some of us have to start leaving early, there is an input card. I want to put this at the front of the discussion. That is incredibly important that we need everybody. Say everybody. We need everybody in this room to fill out. We can't talk about what we need to be done if we're not going to do that extra and put our name down and be a part of getting it done. How is this input card going to be used? It's not going to be used for you to get harassed or to get spam emails. But what we want to do is to figure out how to reach out and involve folks in the subsequent meetings that are coming. And these gatherings don't need to be shaped by the city. They don't need to be shaped by myself. They need to be shaped by community. And so we want to be inviting you to be a part of the curating and the designing of how these gatherings happen so that we also can think about the kind of accessibility that we need to think about in service to these gatherings. And I don't just mean in terms of sight and vision and mobility, but there are a lot of ways that we need to think about um, accessibility. You know, what does it mean for certain community members to participate in processes that require some extra support? We want to think about all that. So we need you to fill out those uh, input cards as they're coming uh, around. And if you do have to jet out, please make sure you leave it with the appropriate folks in the lobby. So we want to open up this mic now for questions, uh, questions that are coming up for people about this whole initiative, questions for the chief, questions for the mayor, uh, questions for the deputy chief, please. I've been working on trying to build some communication workshops and practice groups in the community that are available to lots of people, as many different people as I can. And I'd like to ask the chief what he can do to help me encourage funding for such ventures with other leadership. Three priorities I have for our police department that I'm thinking about for this year. Number one is community violence intervention. Number two is our budget. Uh, budget is a very extreme problem for our city right now. We're looking at facing cuts, not just with police, with all of our general fund departments. And so when we ask any question about finding funding, uh, it's in that entire context. And so I think through this process, and Ben kind of touched on it, if we can come up with a strategy together, we can co-create that, and we identify the things that actually need to be done that we think are going to be effective, and we cost those out, then we can start talking about how to identify funding for those. Right now, we are in an environment uh, where there's just not enough funding for current resources on the city side, I'm talking about government side. Um, and so that's kind of where my mind is right now about funding. So I think we need to go through this process, identify some priorities as a community for this topic specifically, and then we can talk about how we possibly fund them. Yeah. Thank you. Please. Thank you. This uh, question is for our police chief. Uh, <laughs> Salem Kaiser School District uh, took a decision to cancel the SRO contract and program. We have 40,000 kids, close to 40,000 kids. One of the guiding principles is collaboration of community and police together in a way that they learn to respect each other and work together. So in the absence of SRO, how do we envision our children learning to understand the police and respect the police and vice versa so that we can build a harmonious community policing model for the future? Uh, what gives me the hope is this ideal or this guiding principle of collaboration. And I think what I love the way Ben described it as far as um, we don't have to like each other or love each other, but when we, we have a shared interest around a certain problem that can bring us together, and we have to be committed to that partnership even when it gets extremely difficult. Um, and I've been in that situation before, too, uh, where we're stronger together and we have to come together regardless of our ideological differences or whatever we're pulling us apart. We need to set that aside because the value of the partnership is so much more important than those differences that we have. And so that's just my general response to that. Specific to SROs and that relationship there, it's you know, done and gone, that's history, and now we need to figure out, we, have, we still have a great, I see some of my school district partners in the room right now, we have an excellent working relationship. Just because that one specific type of relationship went away, uh, we still communicate regularly around threats and um, student activities, but I do believe we need to create more spaces, since it's not going to be that organic relationship of an SRO continual presence in a schoolroom, right? This doesn't exist anymore. There are other opportunities for those interactions to occur. 
Um, just as some practical examples, what we're doing is we're entering into formal agreements. If you take a look at our strategic plan, there's a lot of information in there. One is about this trust building, especially around youth. And what we've done for the past two years is that we've engaged in relationships like with uh, Salvation Army and with the Croc Center, signed MOUs with how we partner with kids programming there with our police officers. Same thing with Boys and Girls Club. Same thing with YMCA. We're interested in anybody else that wants to partner with us around child uh, you know, youth engagement with police. We want to enter into those relationships together, and so we're formalizing some of that. So if it's not happening the way it's did before in the schools, we're making sure it happens in other venues outside of the school district. So I think that's extremely important, though. If, if I could just, I want to plus one uh, something with all the great conversations that are um, happening, and I think I see brothers going to come uh, in one moment, all the great conversations that are happening about youth, our young people, and what needs to happen in terms of police community relationships Important discussions. We got to keep having it. The conversations about law, we got to keep having it. But I also want to highlight something. When it comes to implementing a community violence intervention strategy, we must follow the data. Because if we're not careful, and I've run into this in multiple cities, people will diagnose where they think we should begin, but the data is not telling us that's where the problem is actually is. So in the city where I first learned these strategies, everyone, as you heard me say, wanted to focus on 14 to 18. They wanted to do youth programs. The data showed us that the average shooter in our community was 24 or 25 years old. The average victim was 30. So we had something called Measure Y and all the money was going to youth programs and we couldn't figure out why the money going to youth programs wasn't tamping down gun violence. But the reason it wasn't was because the young people weren't the people shooting. It was the young adults. And once we made the switch and moved away from Measure Y and went to Measure Z, that's when we got to the five years, 50% reduction, right? So I really want to invite us, even if we have maybe a and I say this respectfully, a pet project. Maybe there's something you're like, I'm really passionate about this. Amazing. But following the data is how you'll actually save lives. Can I just quickly chime in on that? And, and again, the sheriff, I've called you out several times, but there's only two programs. I'm going to use an example here. Sometimes we can think about violence. Sometimes I think about violent crime as a public health issue too, right? We think about um, addiction. We think about addiction and trying to deflect people from the criminal justice system and actually what works to help pull people out of their addiction. It's peer mentors, people that have a history of being addicted that have pulled themselves out of that situation. Now they come alongside other people that they can relate to. They're credible messengers and they help them guide them out of that issue and problem. It's the same thing you're talking about here. I don't have, my lived experience is way different than someone that's grown up in a life of violence in our community. I don't have that sort of credible messenger ability myself, but if we find people like that in our community, we think about it more of a public health way. So I'm calling it out, Sheriff, because there's only two programs that do that work in the state of Oregon. There's about to be a lot more from the Measure 110 reform that just happened, but it's LEAD. It's Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. Your program is being looked at as a model all across the state now. Um, and I just want to call that out because that's an example. You can apply that same line of thinking. People that we may consider having some troubled past and some challenges in the past that have pulled themselves out of that situation and now are helping others do the same. We can apply that same line of thinking towards young men, 18 to 35, in our community that are high risk. If, if Brother, could I just have you wait one second? There was a brother that was ahead of you. I just want to call it forward. Thank you, sir. Please. Hola, ¿qué tal? Mi nombre es Amador, de Enlace Cross-Cultural eh, de Desarrollo Comunitario. Eh, quiero este, la ayuda de Angie para que me ayude a traducir. Ok, por muchos años hemos trabajado en el vecindario Norgit en colaboración con diferentes organizaciones. So, for many years, he's been working in the Northgate Neighborhood Association, doing lots of different projects. Eh, la pregunta es, eh, eh, una de las estrategias que me gustaría que incluyeran, no me dio tiempo de, de uh, decirlo. He said that he didn't get an opportunity to give input on the uh, principles, and so we'd like to do that now. Es eh, una inclusión real de la comunidad. A real inclusion of the community. Esta es la segunda vez, eh, um, el segundo evento que he participado, y en el data, en el data que es importante... 
This is the second event that he has participated in and in the data, the data that's being presented. Una pregunta que tengo para el, chef, el, el chief, um, please. <laughs> A question for you, chief. Es, eh, ahor hasta ahorita, ¿qué, eh, ¿qué tipo de comunidad o cuál, eh, qué, qué comunidad es la que está más afectada y la que está haciendo, este, la que está haciendo el, 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 el shooting? El tiroteo. Mm. Okay. So, which is the community that is most affected But also, which is the demographic that is doing the shooting? Hasta ahorita. Well, to, up to today. Yeah, it's about 50% of our shootings. And so there's obviously other demographics involved too. But about 50% of our shootings involve Latinos as victims and suspects. So this is the community. If you follow the data, again, this isn't about labeling a community. This is about reducing risk. And if we need to focus our resources, we can have the biggest impact if we focus on and interact with our Latino community around this issue. Okay, um, este es el segundo evento. So this is the second event. Y, y, el, y el, este, el flyer está en español. And, and the, the flyer is in Spanish. Y esta conversación es súper importante para que este sea también en español. La anterior también. Mm -hmm. And so it's super important that when we communicate, that we communicate the information in both English, but... Spanish is also needed. Entonces, este, um, vamos a hablar de data. So let's talk about the data. Eh, aquí el data se necesita el español. So the data requires Spanish. Para que la comunidad hispana, que es más afectada. So that our most affected community, our Hispanic community. En una o de otra forma, se okay. requiere esta información en español. In one way or another, the data should be pre presented in Spanish for them. Entonces no queremos ser, he, he tenido muchas experiencias en liderazgo. And he has a lot of experience in leadership. Que las principales este, presentaciones. So the primary presentations. Son en inglés. Are in English. Y la comunidad hispana está involucrada en esos temas. And the Hispanic community is very involved in those topics. Pero después, hasta después de las principales conversaciones, incluyen en español. So then, after the primary presentations uh, are done, then it's an afterthought that the Hispanic community is thought of. Y es por eso que la parte de nosotros de trabajar con la comunidad y poder colaborar, estamos, nosotros colaboramos, y muchas gracias por esta oportunidad de, este, de, 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 de poder estar aquí, pero este, la expectativa era de... Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. <laughs> so that was a lot. So, <laughs> so what he's trying to say is that he's here to collaborate. And so he wants to make sure that we continue that collaborative process so that the people most affected are involved. Yeah. See? Mm -hmm. okay. And thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Very good. Uh, I'll just Is, is this our dear brother, hermano? I, I, I would just would love for us to be able to talk before you leave because I also wonder what it would look like if we could actually make one of the events that we do, the primary language, be Spanish over English so that the community and the population gets to come and experience it in their heart language. Okay. So we'd love to follow up. So it's a line we say, repeat after me again, say targeted strat. No, that's not how I say the line. Say universal strategies, universal strategies. don't always lead to universal goals. Don't lead to universal goals. Say targeted strategies, targeted strategies lead to universal goals. To so I'm, the, the reason I, I really want us to think about that is what I'm hearing our brother lift up is that the community who is most impacted is having to participate with this in a way that does not center their language needs as, as primary. And so we need to think about as a community, how do we cultivate to ensure that the community most impacted uh, gets that? It's something that we call target universalism. We'll talk more about that over the course of the next uh, several sessions so that we make sure that our Spanish speakers, Latino relatives are centered um, in this work and we're following your lead. I'm really grateful for that contribution. Uh, anybody else want to bring a question? I know we're We're getting almost about time. Oh, please, there you are. Thank you. Um, I have an observation. 
a story and a question. The observation builds upon what the gentleman, previous gentleman said. If, the, if a community has a problem, how should, does it make sense for another community to solve their problem? Uh, the story is I read a fascinating book years ago called Tribal Leadership. And it said, it used some examples, and it said, people whose life in general sucked thought a step up in life was joining a gang. And the question is, how do, you, how do we eliminate the people seeing uh, joining a gang to be a step up well, really convince them to see it as a step down. And what I'm willing to do is, this dynamic is, it's a presentation, questions, answers, but sometimes when people just sit around a table and talk about things, or share things, boy, what comes out is just amazing. And... Uh, I'm Social Justice Chair at the Unitarian Church at Center and Cordon Street. And if you want to have discussions like that of the community that's involved, where people sit around the table and talk and somebody takes notes, just let me know and we will make sure it's done. Thank you. And appreciate that. Let's appreciate him. <clears throat> I just wanted just to give us an example of kind of a conversation that he's lifted up. These are some of the tactics that are part of CVI strategies. One of the ones which Chief knows very well that we've done in some cities is called a call-in. And in the call-in, what we've done is we've identified those that are actually at the high risk to uh, either be a victim of violence or we're actively shooting at others. And myself, at the time I was a faith leader, along with law enforcement, we had the sheriffs there, we had the DA, we had the U.S. attorney, as well as we had those who uh, formerly incarcerated relatives. We had mothers who had lost their kids to violence. We would all come and sit at a table and have a conversation about how we would put the guns down. And by the time we got done with the end of that practice, we would do it four times a year, bringing the people who are actively shooting at each other. And the rate of people making decisions in that meeting to put the guns down and choose life was at 70%. So these are, again, more ideas and practices that you can implement right here in Salem and save lives. I'm going to get out of the way so we can get a couple more questions in, please. So we've been talking about following the data so much, and I live and work in Northeast Salem, but both my home and my place of employment are in the county because such a large percentage of Northeast Salem really is unincorporated Hayesville. So how do we follow the data if the data is incomplete and is there a timeline for the county's data analysis? For us, this took us about six months. Once we you know, got an agreement in place with some researchers to do this for us, it took us about six months. So I can't speak for the sheriff. I do know that they have an agreement in place now, and this is actually in process. It's just starting. So I would say we would see the results of this before the end of this year. We'll have additional data to look at, specifically what's happening in our county jurisdictions. Accurate to say, Sheriff? Okay. Please. So I have a quick question about Oakland. And um, <clears throat> what you and your community did is commendable. But it seems like in Oakland, violence has risen over the last two, three years. I think there was like 120 homicides last year. So what happened? What, you, you had this going, and then what's happened? We stopped following the data. So what happened is once we got the reduction, the stress of following the process as we were fell off, and a lot of different ideas started coming, saying, well, we don't need to keep implementing the CVI strategy there was a new group of people that said, I think we should create an office of violence prevent, a department of violence prevention. There were some other people that said, well, we now need to start investing in this because shootings are not at an all time high. And we took our eye off the ball. And subsequently, what happened in the last few years is the problem analysis changed. So now they're doing a new problem analysis led by some of the colleagues from California Partnership for Safe Communities. And what they're identifying now is that the people who are shooting are now not 
18 to, I mean, 24, 25, they're actually younger. So now the strategy that they created, because they stopped following the data, now it's not working. And we went through a whole political crisis that was really all from a lot of people that agreed with each other in terms of political ideology. But there was a lot of egos in the way um, that wouldn't center the problem instead of centering what they wanted. And so after three years of spike violence, now they're re-implementing what we should have never stopped doing and doing it right now. Well, it's easy to do this. We did it. Right. And then, as you said, take your eye off the ball. Absolutely. That is easy to happen. So one of the things, thank you. One of the things that I encourage people to have and maintain. Yeah, please appreciate her. Repeat these words after me. Community working group. That is the body that needs to sit over the gun violence prevention strategies, not just when it's bad, but even when it's good. So once the gun related shootings, uh, gun related shootings, that's silly. The, the gun related violence goes down. That's not time for us to take our eyes off the ball. That's actually time for us to double down and make sure it's a part of culture. Let's get, I know we've got several people now in line and, and it's about that time. So, um, I'm going to ask us to do some rapid fire uh, questions, and then I'm going to be handing it off in just a couple of minutes. Please. Sir, I thank you for coming here. And I know this is probably costing the city money for you to be here. But here's my question. It could be for the mayor or the chief. The chief we met, he knows I was irritated. I took the community police academy and I was irritated. And I'm irritated now. Because here we are having a thing regarding gun violence, but the data shows it's been going on for how long? And Chris, I've known you for four years. Your first priority has been homeless, 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 homeless. But public safety has been put down, way down. And I wonder why all of a sudden you want to, you guys want to bring this up when Salem's been hurting for three years with shootings, I live by McKay Park. There was a shooting the other day. They caught a 15-year-old kid with a gun. You know, and it's getting irritating. So my question is, why now? Why not two years ago or three years ago? And I see, Chris, you just shrugged your shoulders. No, we're just listening to each other. Who should answer? Well, no, but no, I'm just... I think I think for, for me, we have the data now. We've looked at it. It's... A, it's something I've been talking about for three years. Like, not, not a lot of people have been paying attention, but in multiple public venues, I've been talking about the rise of violent crime since I got here three years ago. Um, the data analysis, the reason why now, I think, is because we actually did a data analysis. It did cost us a little bit of money. Had the researchers do that five years' worth of analysis. That data got a lot of interest. It lifted up the issue. And we did that. I, we did that as a police department. We looked at the data. We created the report. And now look at all of us. So we're paying attention to the data. That's, that's why now, that's, the, that's a simple answer. Why now is because the data is glaring and we're all looking at it. It's getting a lot of interest. If, if I can help us just because I want to make sure we get a few voices in. And if I know we're at time, can I, can I ask for us to give at least just another five minutes? Because we have some of our uh, women community members and neighbors. And I, I want to make sure we get their voices in here. <clears throat> as a part of the discussion. So thank you, brother. Well, I, I just, and clear. Let, just, me, let, me, let me say this one thing before, before you go on. When we think about public safety, I really encourage us to recognize that it's like a string of yarn in a ball of yarn, right? So it's, it's not just one expression or another. When we think about unsheltered relatives and unhoused people, if you look at the data, one of the highest percentages of people that are being impacted by gun violence in Salem are actually unsheltered people. So a part of this strategy, the more you lean into the data, and if we come into it, certain with critique as we have it, certainly come in asking hard questions, but I really want to encourage us to keep the problem centered. I'm not sure what has happened in the past. The question is, what needs to happen right now? And, and if there were mistakes and fumbles that have happened in the past, the opportunity for us to get it right starts tomorrow and I want to just really encourage us to keep our focus there. Thank you, brother. Let me create some space for him and then we'll create some spaces there. A few more minutes, please. Okay, so this is a question for you. I would like 
uh, if you could, to paint a mental picture for us of what a successful, mature CVI looks like. What are the methods, tactics, nuts and bolts? What does this thing look like at the end? Absolutely. Um, I'm going to refer you to a tool to reflect on and really get it, which is a case study in hope, which you can Google. It's done by the Gifford Center. That's really going to unpack it. But the nuts and bolts are going to be making sure you have a law enforcement uh, um, group that focuses on those that are at the highest risk. So you do. There is an enforcement function that needs to happen for CVI model, a consistent community work group that has people collaborating across difference shooting reviews case management and case study of the people that are actually at risk to commit violence and directed targeted resources for those that are identified to be a high risk or a low risk. If you have those five factors working consistently, the bonus I would add is you have to have some uh, process that activates the community to participate in the work. So some people aren't going to go to the shooting reviews. They're not going to get so deep involved. One of the things I started in Oakland along with others was called our community night walks. Every Friday we would get between 25 to 75 neighbors and residents to walk the neighborhoods that were highest with gun violence and build relationships with the people that were impacted. That night walk has now been going for 12 years. They'll be walking this Friday and it's something now that has activated community. And then when it's necessary to actually vote to fund a measure to resource a gun violence prevention strategy, you've built enough cachet in the community for people to lean in. I would offer those six tactics as one to ground it. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to preface that these three ladies are here together, but one's going to speak on behalf of the group. Okay. Come on. Uh, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Maricela Lagos. Good evening. My name is Maricela Lagos. Uh, soy coordinadora de programas de prevención para uh, jóvenes. I'm a prevention coordinator with youth programs. En la organización La Coalición para la Igualdad de Salem Kaiser. And they are here with Salem Kaiser Coalition for Equality. Y esta tarde estoy aquí. And so this evening I'm here. Con un grupo de madres. With a group of moms. Del grupo de liderazgo de nuestra organización. From our leadership group with Salem Kaiser Coalition. Uh, primero para agradecer. First, I'd like to thank por este tipo de eventos. Thank you for this type of event. Pero también quiero hacer eco a la voz de mi compañero Amador. But I'd also like to echo the voice of my friend Amador. Necesitamos este tipo de charlas en español. We need this type of conversation meeting in Spanish. Una de las razones es one of the reasons porque nuestra comunidad de padres y madres is because our community of parents, fathers and mothers, Latinos, Hispanic, nos importa mucho, it's important to us, la educación y la seguridad de nuestros hijos. It's important to us, our child's education and safety. Estamos en completa disposición, and we are completely at your disposal, de ser parte de este cambio, to be part of this change. Estamos comprometidas en ayudar a nuestro vecindario. We are committed to helping our neighborhoods. Porque queremos todos lo mismo, la seguridad. Be Perdón. Because we all want the same thing, and that is la seguridad, the safety, y el éxito académico de nuestros hijos. And the academic success of our children. Estamos completamente seguras. We are completely sure que la educación de nuestros hijos va a ser el cambio en nuestra comunidad. That, otra vez. Que la educación de nuestros hijos. That uh, the education of our children. Va a ser el cambio en la comunidad. Will be the change in our community. Estamos aquí para pedirles programas. We're here to ask for programs. En español, biculturales. In Spanish, bicultural. Para nuestros niños. For our children. En las escuelas. In our schools. Estamos pidiendo ayuda también para las escuelas para que mejoren y nuestros hijos tengan éxito académico. And so we're also asking for help in our schools so that our children can have that academic success. Gracias. Y'all know that one. <laughs> Gracias, señora. Thank you very much. We'll have our, our, oh, we got two more. These will be our two final uh, comments for the evening, please. Do you need me. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Yes, well, thank you, Ben, Mayor Hoy, Chief Womack, thank you.
and this is this is for you, Chief Wobeck, is with the the number, and we hear the numbers out of Oakland, the the one thousand, and there's the two hundred fifty shooters that have been identified, and and here in the city of Salem, Chief, has that number been? Is it concrete? And have those persons been? Is the intervention process underway right now with those people that have been identified as shooters in our community? I do think there's a gap there, and the tools that we have are, are kind of like hammer hammers, right? Like we do law enforcement. That's why I'm engaging in this conversation. I do think there's a gap there. We need to identify as a community how we want to do intervention and prevention with folks at high risk that, are, that doesn't necessarily just involve enforcement. There's going to be an enforcement component, as Ben mentioned. Of course, if someone actually commits an act of violence, that we need to hold that person accountable. We need to do everything we can to try to prevent that also. But that's, that's, I think that's where more importantly the community does come in. And so I think however we can identify those folks at risk and refer or share that information in some way, we've got to figure that out, then we can have a community-based intervention process that's much more effective um, and, and keep us in our lane of just solving crimes really well and doing what we do. Yeah. Thank you. And too. God. Get up and back. Thank you. Uh, this is for a mayor or chief. Um, as this is an initiative is involving a uh, tool protected by rights, uh, what Second Amendment advocacy organizations are you planning to uh, invite as uh, stakeholders and partners? Every group, every perspective, every voice matters in this conversation. This is a kickoff meeting. We did a little light touch on community input here. This is not what we're actually going to do for the next three meetings. We are going to sit down at tables together, and we are going to dig in, and Mr. McBride here is going to help us facilitate that conversation. I'm going to step away. It's not going to be a police-facilitated conversation. I'm a stakeholder at the table. I'll be part of that conversation, but we're going to facilitate a conversation with the community. Fill out the card. If you want to be engaged and you want to come, pay attention to the, the, the events that we announce. Fill out that card with your contact information, and we will make sure that you get invited to every conversation. All right. But before I, I uh, yield my stead, just want to say thank you to everybody for the attention, for the energy. Um, I know this is heavy stuff, but I hope you're feeling uh, inspired. I hope you're feeling encouraged around this work. Um, there's nobody coming to save us. We are who we need in this moment. Uh, so let's do the work uh, to widen the circle of human concern, uh, help to save lives uh, and create peace and belonging here in Salem. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be your guest host, and I'll offer it back up to Angela. Thank you. Thank you, y gracias a todos. Um, thank you for that extra five minutes. Gracias por los cinco minutos extras que nos regalaron. I do want to just make one more last plea. Una preguntita o una este, sugerencia más. Que necesito que todos completan su tarjeta para mantenernos esa comunicación. So I really want to stress that it's important for us to continue this conversation. And we need your contact information. So on this card... It is English on one side, Spanish on the other, English en un lado, Español en el otro. And there's just the section on your contact, así su manera de, eh, para que nosotros nos podamos contactar con usted. And then there is the ideas and suggestions you, you may have, ideas y sugerencias. And then also the bottom piece is que la parte de abajo dice, I want to help. So I need that section filled out too. So, y si tienen ideas, como ustedes las mamás, que ya están listas para ayudar, please fill out that bottom section. Necesito que llenen la tarjeta completamente. And one last thank you again to our excellent facilitator, Ben McBride. To <laughs> and to Mayor Hoy and to Chief Womack for their time and their presence here tonight. Y gracias también a nuestro facilitador, el señor Ben McBride, nuestro alcalde, Chris Hoy, y nuestro jefe de policía de Salem. Gracias por su presencia y estar aquí para este asunto tan importante. Thank you again, all of you. Have a good evening. Buenas noches. <laughs>